Thank you all for coming, especially on this somewhat snowy day by Edmonton standards. I'm Sarah Forge, uh, Vice Provost Learning Initiatives in the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic. I've been truly delighted to work with a really dedicated um, group of people. Debbie Burshton, who's the Vice Dean in FGSR, Tammy Hopper, who's the Vice Provost Programs, and Janice Miller-Young, who's the Academic Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning to organize this event. And of course, we're absolutely thrilled that Dr. Harvey Weingarten is joining us for his keynote presentation, Learning Outcomes for the Non-Believer, Why a Research Intensive University Should Care. As many of you know, this is our second event in 2017 to advance the discussion on learning outcomes at the U of A. Many of you will remember um, last May, we organized a retreat where we invited the Campus Alberta Quality Council, in-house experts, and a variety of panelists to learn more about developing and implementing and assessing learning outcomes. I'm pleased to see that a number of you were able to come back for this event. Before I introduce Dr. Weingarten, I wanted to set the context for his keynote with a few key learnings from our event in May. Our Provost and Vice President Academic, Dr. Stephen Dew, spoke about the value of learning outcomes for students, program administration, and evaluation, and decision-making about curricula. We heard that learning outcomes are a priority for both the CAQC and the Ministry of Advanced Education. We heard some stories of development and implementation from Augustana, engineering and nursing. We heard about um, some homegrown best practices in evaluation and assessment of learning outcomes from the faculties of arts, education, and pharmacy. Finally, we as a working group heard from retreat participants about the need to continue the conversation and move forward with more training opportunities. And I'm happy to report that our Center for Teaching and Learning has responded to this need with training provided over the summer on learning outcomes, and they're putting the final touches on a learning outcomes manual, which should be available soon. In addition to Dr. Weingarten's talk, FGSR has activities planned at the graduate level, and we are pleased to announce that Brenda Brower from Queen's University will be coming to U of A in the spring. Please save the date in your calendars, March 16th, 2018. With all of this work going on for learning outcomes, it seems fitting then today that we hear from Dr. Weingarten. President Emeritus of the University of Calgary, Dr. Weingarten understands the Alberta context. Under his leadership, the University of Calgary was at the forefront of initiatives to improve the student experience, working closely with the student body to understand their needs. For the past seven years, Dr. Weingarten has worked in the heart of, learning outcomes, of the learning outcomes debate in Ontario. As President and CEO of the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, or HECO, Dr. Weingarten has driven initiatives to put HECO at the forefront of research and advocacy for higher education in Ontario. We are truly honoured that he has accepted to share some of what he has learned with us today, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Harvey Weingarten. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for reminding me what Alberta winters really mean. Um, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, an initiative, uh, a dynamic, this thing called learning outcomes that I do believe is, is a transformative event in the way we think and uh, conduct higher education. I'll say a bunch of things. I'll show you a bunch of slides. Um, I hope that I touch on the things that are important to you, but I will be sure to reserve time at the end. So if I fail in that mission, uh, you can ask me questions and direct me in the right way for you. So let me start by saying that my whole life in higher education has been at serious research intensive universities. As an undergraduate at McGill, a graduate student at Yale, professor, provost at McMaster, and then as president of the University of Calgary, by the way, I did work in Alberta. I am seriously mindful of the Calgary-Edmonton thing, and so I apologize in advance that to anyone who doesn't consider the University of Calgary a serious research university. Um, but I worked in these places because I really believe in them. The mission of universities is different from the mission of high schools. It's different from the mission of colleges. And the mission of those cadre of universities called research universities, especially serious ones like you are here, have a very special place. In my opinion, 
if Canada is to prosper as a country and to remain globally competitive, we need these research intensive universities to do their best work and to fire on all cylinders. These are the institutions that take a group of people, students, and they prepare the leaders in the future of the country. And if they work well, Canada will do okay. If we create a situation where the research universities can't do what they can do and perform at their best and optimize what they can do and their contribution, then we are in trouble. But the other reason I loved working at research universities, I believed in the mission. I believe deeply and fervently in research because I believe that a research trained individual has the core skills and capacities to prosper in this crazy, goofy, complex, complicated world in which we live. And when I taught, be it, be it courses to graduates or undergraduates or postdocs, what I was looking for, what I perceived my mission to be, was to train people skilled in the competencies and capabilities of a researcher. Because to me, that was the foundation of a higher education that would allow these people to prosper both professionally and personally. So what was I looking for? Yes, I spent probably far too much time trying to drill a bunch of information about human physiology in the brain and controls of feeding into the, into the heads of my students. I spent a lot of time on content. You would expect no less of a highly educated undergraduate or graduate student. But more than content, I wanted these students to develop a set of skills that were the foundation of research skills. And what are they? The ability to ask important questions. The ability, once you articulate that question, by the way, I'll send these slides to any of you so you don't have to write any of this down. Once you ask the important question, go out there and collect evidence, information, data that's relevant to the problem and appraise it in a serious way. Then fashion solutions, interventions that'll help illuminate the problem or or, or, or solve the challenge. Communicate that to your peers, to the lay people, to whoever you have to interact and engage with to make sure that what you have learned and your solution is appropriately implemented and solves the challenge. I needed these people to be problem solvers. And as long as a student demonstrated these skills or developed these skills, they could work in my lab. And the moment that I came to a conclusion or that others helped me come to a conclusion that they were never going to be very good at some elements of this, they couldn't be in my lab anymore. When I fashioned courses, this is what I wanted students to know. That I want them to know all the latest information about eating disorders, of course. But that was going to change over time. This is what they fundamentally had to be able to do. And this, this I think, although some people may use different vocabulary, are the fundamentals of what research intensive universities want to produce in their students. The capacity to perform at a high level with these skills. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm going to change hats. I'm going to take off the hat of a university administrator professor, and I'm going to put on the hat of an employer. These are the people who hire our students. These are the people who there's so much chatter about in terms of what employers are looking for in the employees they have to hire now and employees of the future. And there is a huge amount of chatter about this. And that chatter has led some people to believe that we shouldn't listen to the employers because 
We don't know what they're telling us. They don't know what they want. But the truth is that employers are remarkably consistent and remarkably articulate about what they are looking for in their current and future hires. How do we know this? Because in my shop, we follow all these surveys. There's a survey a week that comes out from an industry sector, comes out from a think tank, comes out from the Business Council of Canada, that speaks to the issue of what are the skills that employers are now looking for. And if you follow this literature and ignore the sidebar chatters, which you always should do, what you find is that employers are remarkably articulate about what they want. These are the skills they're looking for, and these are the skills that they most need in their employees. These are the skills that they're complaining about the most that they're not seeing. Communication skills, a set of interpersonal skills, resilience, being able to work with groups, teamwork, etc. Critical thinking skills, problem solving skills. Oh my God. I look at this list of what employers want in their employees. And it's exactly what I wanted in my undergraduate and graduate students. I have never lived, I've been in universities now for 35 plus years. I have never lived in a time when there is more convergence between what the academy wants to do in research intensive universities and what employers want us to do than we are seeing now. We want the same skills and attributes. And you can follow, again as we do, the media reports. That's all they're talking about. They want problem solving skills, communication skills, soft skills, whole variety of words, but it all means the same thing. It's what we want. The ability to ask questions, collect information, appraise it, do something useful and relevant with it, communicate that to you, to others, and get on with the job of solving problems. If you look at places like the World Economic Forum, they keep lists from their work that they do, surveying employers around the world. What are the skills that they want? And it always comes down to these same research skills. And so we are living in a world now where for both the people in the research community, for what we do at research intensive universities, and for employees, employers, the enduring attributes are the attributes of skills. Notice what they're not talking about. They're not talking about content. The assumption is that, they will gra that you will graduate students with the content information and data they need. And you know why the assumption is there? Because you do it. Canadian universities are remarkably good at graduating students with the, with the content and knowledge they need in their field. And that's why Canadian engineers, Canadian doctors, Canadian graduates from a, and a whole host of other disciplines can find work anywhere around the world. They're highly sought after because the content and knowledge we have gotten extremely good at. But the content and knowledge isn't enough. Why? Because students who we have now will change jobs five to six times in their career. Content is changing at a rapid rate. The language is used for coding today Two years from now, no one even remembers what they were. But that's easy to teach. And if you believe people who make such prognostications, I'm very, I'm very cynical about people who make predictions. I'm reminded of what Yogi Berra said, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. But what Yogi Berra and others remind, but what these people who analyze labor markets tell us, is that a lot of the jobs our students will get or will have 10, 15 years from now don't even exist today. So
So in a dynamic environment like that, where people change jobs all the time, where we don't know what jobs are going to exist, is content today important? Of course. But the enduring attributes are the, ability, are the question asking skills, the analysis skills, the appraisal skills, the communication skills of our students. And that's what we've always wanted to see in our graduates. And that's those skill sets are the ones that people are identifying in increasing demand. Let me tell you what people don't care about anymore. They don't care about the degree you have. They don't care about the field of study you come from. There are many employers now who don't even want to see your university transcript. They don't care. They don't care what program you took. They don't care what university you graduated from. Because they know something, which we should all remember, which is that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between a field of study and jobs. This is work that we did looking at a couple of linking two data sets. If you look at, we've ex I've explained. I used to have this on, uh, go to the web, and you can see it in dynamic, and it flows beautifully with beautiful colors. But it almost never works in a presentation. So I made static slides. This shows you if you have, if you came from the law, social, or behavioral sciences, that field of study, look at the range of occupations those people occupy. And the reverse is true as well. That if you look at people who are in a particular profession, teachers and professors, look at all the different fields of studies they came from. The field of study, and increasingly, the place where you got your degree doesn't hold the signal value it once held. What people are looking for, what they care about, what their the signals are, is all about skills. You'll excuse me, by the way, if I go to a two-minute editorial cynical excursion about our governments. Our governments are spending gazillions of dollars trying to get you to enroll people in certain professions, in certain fields, because they think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between fields of study and jobs. The reality is that since World War II, when we started doing these things in a much more serious way, no one has been able to predict the job market. And no one has ever been able to predict which fields of study, which degrees, make people successful in which jobs. That isn't stopping us from spending millions of dollars on this. That isn't stopping the government from tormenting you about why you have students in these fields and not in these fields. And if they simply stopped for a moment and looked at these two slides, they would realize they're playing a mugs game. End of the editorial aside. What skills do we expect from a university graduate? Disciplinary knowledge. No one is prepared to give up on this. And you folks do a brilliant job of doing this. We expect students to know the latest concepts in their fields, to be able to manipulate the tools, mathematical or otherwise, in their disciplines. We expect them to know how to solve equations, etc. That is fundamental. And no one is prepared to let you give up on that knowledge base, that content. You must do that. But surely we want more from a university graduate. We want certain basic cognitive skills. We want them to be literate and numerate. I won't now, OK, well, I'll leave evaluation. To it. We want them to be literate and numerate. Certainly that's a skill set we would expect a university graduate to have. We expect them to have certain higher order cognitive skills, problem solving, critical thinking, communication. And for many people, although not necessarily for all, we expect them to have certain transferable skills. They should have a good attitude. They should know how if you fail the first time in a job task, you know how to, may I use an Alberta expression, pick yourself up by your britches, go out of the chute again, and do a better job the next time. We expect them to be persistent. This is kind of the range of things most of us talk about when we say, what are the skills, the range of skills 
a university a student should have when they graduate, certainly one that graduates from a distinguished university like this. And so we're left with the fundamental question. Do students graduate with the knowledge, skills, capacities, and competencies that promote personal and professional success? Are we doing the job? Are we doing the job of graduating students with the research skills we want, which are the same skills that employers want, which are the same things we talk about all the time about why people should come to university? Now, everyone has their own test or way of evaluating the answer to this question. Are students graduating skills? I thought I'd tell you mine. If I look outside my window, work, one Young Street, Toronto, right at the waterfront, I look out onto these condos. Hundreds of them. People who populate these condos because we're a block and a half away from the financial district, from Bay Street where all the law firms are, the big accounting firms. These are students who've gone to our institutions and for the most part have degrees. And so I conduct a little, I'm walking one day beyond and I, because they also have little dogs, 50% of these people have little dogs. There's little strips of lawn that have been built up for these people to walk their dogs. Goofy because then they put up signs like this. So I'm walking by one day and it says private property, dogs must be on leash at all times and not defecate on property. And I show this to my colleagues and I say, what do you think of this sign? And they all start to laugh. But what very few of them point out is that defecate is spelled incorrectly. Okay, that's my test for literacy, which by the way, is remarkably consistent with what most professors at places like this tell us. Our undergraduates can spell, they can't construct a sentence, they can't develop an argument, they can't, they're not as literate as we would like. So I used to do some work out in New Brunswick and I, there was a store in New Brunswick called the Nerd Store. I love that store, it's gone bankrupt. Tells you something about the business longevity of stores like that. Uh, and they would sell all these goofy things and one day I'm walking in there and there's this, I buy this coffee cup. There are this many types of people in this world, those who understand binary and those who don't. So I go back to the shop, I buy the coffee cup. I say to people, what's wrong? What, what can you tell me about this coffee cup? And they all laugh, just like you laugh. And I say, so what's wrong with this? And they say, oh, come on, Harvey, look. They say there's 10 types of people in this world, but binary means two. So those can't go together. Stupid sentence, they're just wrong. Say so anything else? I work with some extraordinarily smart people, many advanced degrees, many of them in quantitative areas. No more than 10% of them have actually said to me, there's nothing funny about this coffee cup. It's just absolutely true because one zero and two is bi means binary. Okay, so my test idiosyncratic as it is, and you should pay no attention to my idiosyncratic test. When I do my, my sampling of my family, of people I know who've gone to post-secondary, they don't come out so well. Okay, but surely there's others. Your president, last week, one of the excellence in research undergraduate education can coexist. He describes beautiful work at the University of Alberta where a bunch of students get together, they want to do a certain kind of work, it's not available, they band together, they recruit some professors, and they do some really remarkable things. This is, good. This is going on peppered like all over the place. Great stuff is going on. Did they acquire the skills that we had hoped would come out of an experience like that? I don't know, and neither does David Turpin. But there's a good reason to be op optimistic about that. Then we go to statements like this. This is a former university president in Ontario who in September 2013 wrote this in an editorial in the Globe and Mail. When a university graduate is recruited, the employer has in their hire an exceptional communicator, an adept researcher, a problem solver, and a critical thinker. 
lovely words. No one I know believes this guy. And if you are inclined, as I am, to say maybe he's right, I say, show me the data. We do have data of people who would disagree vehemently with Max Blau. These surveys come out all the time. This is from a survey that was done by McKinsey, 2012. They ask, whether, they ask a bunch of people, did your post-secondary experience give you the skills you need to succeed in the workplace? 72% of educators said yes. A minority, 45% of graduates said no. By the way, over 50% of graduates said nothing they learned in post-secondary prepared them for their job. That's patently untrue, but that's what they believe. And 42% of employers said yes. There's other surveys like this. I'll show you one more. 2014, there's a survey that's done on a regular basis of provosts, chief academic officers. And they survey academic officers. They ask them, does the education you give in your shop prepare students for a job? 96% of chief academic officers said, university does a good job of preparing students for the workforce. Only 11% of the business leaders they surveyed agreed with that statement. Something weird is going on here. Differences of opinion about whether we're doing a reasonable job, a good job, preparing students with the skills they need to go out there and lead successful lives. And by the way, I'm not just talking about perfect, you know, jobs. If, if, if unfortunately you get cancer and you go to your oncologist, your oncologist says, well, there's three treatments I can try. This one has these morbidity effects and side effects and cure rates. This one has this, this one has this. Which one do you want me to do? The patient is expected to contribute to this. I used to do an informal survey at Calgary. Um, uh, so, many of the, so many of the decisions made in the healthcare sector are based, are based upon the risk analyses, different levels of risk. And I would present a problem to the students that would require them to take numbers that probability of risk, risk, et cetera, and form some conclusion of what they would do. It was disheartening how many students could not walk through an analysis like this. And that's why we have places like The Economist. This was the second cover story in The Economist where they pointed out that the whole world is going to university. Is it worth it? And let me assure you of one thing. When The Economist starts asking questions about the value of a university education, you got to know that other people are asking those questions as well. So, who's right? Are our students graduating with the skills and the knowledge they need to leave successful, reasonable lives? There are people in this camp with this opinion. There are people in this camp with this opinion. There are people who have surveys and data that support their view on this side. And there are people who write eloquent articles and have some data, not usually a lot, for their point on this side. So I learned something very important in graduate school. I learned that I don't have to know the answer to the question, but I have to know the method of getting to the answer. And in my world, if we want to know and answer the question of whether students are graduating with the skills we need them to, we have to measure this. We have to simply go and say, let's find out. In the same way we find out whether they can solve a differential equation or understand deep meaning of Greek mythology, we need to find out whether students have the skills they need we want them to have, employers want them to have, and they want to have. And that's where the issue of learning outcomes comes, comes from. The concept of learning outcomes is remarkably simple 
and remarkably not mysterious. The essence of learning outcomes is this. A group, a department, a faculty, university, defines what graduates should know and be able to do when they finish. And then what they do is they measure whether the desired knowledge and capacities have been acquired. It's as simple as that. We shouldn't allow personal stories, anecdotes, gut feels to dominate the skills controversy in Canada, to dominate the question of whether universities provide value. We should simply go and measure it. And if part of what we need are students to have a certain skill set to navigate life, we should measure whether they have it. That's it. And let me tell you a couple of other things. This is what quality assurance is all about. When I look to see what the quality assurance official bodies ask for from you folks, it's outrageous. If you want to have a new program, the University of Alberta, you have to submit something to the Quality Assurance Board, whatever, whatever it's called. And they will ask you all kinds of questions. They will ask you about the number of PhDs teaching in the program, the number of contact hours, the amount of library resources you have. Why is that relevant? Why do you have to submit a stack of papers this high for you people who know what you're doing to justify putting on a new program that you think is important? The only thing they should ask you is, what are the outcomes you're looking for? What knowledge and skills will students have if they finish from this program? And how do you plan to measure whether, those, whether that knowledge and skills have been acquired? And that's all quality assurance is about. It's not about inputs. It's not about processes. And by the way, new factoid for me, the people who put up signs in the men's washroom in the University of Alberta understand this, understand this extraordinarily well. In front of my urinal was a sign that said quality assurance. If there's a leaky faucet, a broken light, an unclean bathroom, call us. What are they telling you? You have expectations of what quality is in a men's washroom at the University of Alberta. And if it's not met, tell us, because we want to drive up the quality. One other thing, this essence of learning outcomes, this is what accountability is about. Governments are all over accountability. They want you to be held accountable, but what should they hold you accountable for? Should they, a government full of people who've never taught at universities, who know very little about what goes on here, the business model, what interaction with students are like, the HR issues, et cetera, really? They're gonna tell you how to do your job? No. Are they gonna tell you whether you should have a 300 seat lecture or a five person problem-based seminar? That's your problem, that's yours for, to figure out. The only thing they should hold you accountable for is the learning that happens. How it happens, you can figure out. But they should hold you accountable to our students again, because the government invests in public education because they want graduates with certain skills and attributes. Are you producing graduating such students? And that is the essence of what accountability is, and we are desperately trying to drive the Ontario government to a point where they lay off pro intervening in institutions, but hold them accountable for outcomes. One other little excursion. So I finished at the University of Calgary in uh, 2010 for a set of reasons. Uh, we decide the best thing for my wife and I is to move to Toronto, and we do. And I get a call from some fellow who runs this place where I now work called the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. And he says, the guy who runs the shop here, the CEO is leaving, we'd like you to do, take the job. 
I said, I don't think so. He says, why not? I said, look, I've worked at universities. I just escaped. Give me a, a little bit of time. And he says, I'm going to send you some stuff. I said, OK. And he sends me a bunch of stuff that folks in the shop have written. It's very scholarly, very high quality research, but doesn't answer a fundamental question for me, which is, what is quality? This is the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. What is quality? How do we measure it? How do we know if we got it? And so I do what I was trained to do in graduate school. I talk to people who are good informants. And uh, I ask for people, give me something to read. And they give me a bunch of stuff. I start reading about quality. And I do this for about two weeks, and I end up with a giant headache, because I'm no further ahead two weeks after the fact than when I started. Because it dawned on me that the way most people were talking about this was that quality was some funny concept that had to do with a standard or threshold to define adequate performance or excellence. But what struck me is no one could define what the standard was. No one could tell me what the threshold was. And certainly no one could tell me when you were so far above the standard or threshold that you were excellent, short of people making assertions. I also knew that institutions Colleges and universities were so different that what might be a standard or threshold for quality in one institution might not be the same at another one. So I said, but luckily for me, there's an organization called the Inst International Standards Organization, the ISO. They're all, ever since World War II, these guys have been all about measuring quality. And this is their definition of quality. Quality of something can be determined by comparing a set of characteristics with a set of requirements. If those characteristics meet all requirements, higher excellent quality is achieved. If those characteristics do not meet all requirements, a lower poor level of quality is achieved. Oh, this is something I could work with. Because it was no different than the slide I showed you before. Tell me what you're trying to do. Tell me what outcomes you're looking for. And if you achieve those outcomes, you're high quality. And if you don't, you're low quality. Again, not a very mysterious concept. And so again, it brought us down to the level of what are the outcomes you're looking for? What are the skills and the knowledge you're looking for from a program that students should have? And did you measure whether those, that knowledge and skills have been achieved? Now, when you start talking about measurement of academic outputs or <coughs> measurement of learning outcomes, <coughs> it's not far, see about with a latency of about four minutes, when someone picks up their hand and says, oh, Mr. Weingarten, you don't know what Albert Einstein said about measurement, do you? Not everything that counts can be measured, and not everything that can be measured counts. And that is the usual preamble into the end of the sentence, which is, so could you please go away and not bug us about measuring <laughs> learning outcomes? It can't be done. So Albert Einstein was an extraordinarily smart man. Turns out now that I've read the book The Other Einstein, he may not have been quite as smart as I thought he was, but it's another story. But he was dead wrong about this. And the person who has captured the current dynamic around measurement of educational and academic outcomes is Peter Drucker, who reminds us what gets measured gets done. And then when people say to me, well, but maybe in Drucker's world that was right, but surely not in a university, surely not measuring academic outcomes, I say to them, tell me, do you measure research quality? Do you have the capacity to measure 
whether that person is a better researcher than that person and should get a grant. Do you have the capacity to measure whether the University of Alberta is a better, more research intensive university than some other university I would pick? Well, of course we do. I said, so really? So let's talk about the indicators. Number of publications, that's a crappy one, right? Put out crap, but much of it, is that really? No, no, we don't. But it's, you know what? It's not unimportant. It's there. Okay, citations get a little more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, but citations isn't everything. Then you get a peer review. Is, is that how you make the judgment? No. Well, we like peer review, and we do use peer review. But you know, there's problems with peer review. Who's on the committee that's doing the assessment, whether they're your friends or not, et cetera. In the world of the universities like yours, we have a domain of activity called research where we do measurements of quality all the time. We are so, we like them so much, we even rank on the basis of them. And yet every single indicator is open to criticism. But we kind of agree that A, this is an important thing to measure, and we do have a set of indicators, however imperfect, when they're put together, do tell a story. And let me suggest to you that the world of education, teaching, and learning outcomes is no more immune to the idea of measurement and to the possibility of measurement as is research. So I'm going to give you an example of how one might do this. Oh, I forgot that. I'm going to describe to you a trial we're running called the Essential Adult Skills Initiative. And because one of the things you learn in my business is every good initiative requires a good acronym, it's known, you'll hear me refer to it as easy. And it's very simple. What we're going to do is use an instrument called the PIAC, which is the first, I wrote it down because I always forget, the Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies. It is the adult equivalent of the PISA test that's used to measure skills of K-12 students across Canada, in fact, around the world. This is an international test. It's available online in both English and French. It's a very sophisticated test because it's an adaptive test. Depending on how you answer a particular question, it leads you in, in a particular direction. And we are going to, and it measures three things, literacy, numeracy, and problem solving. By literacy, it doesn't mean can you read and write and spell. It means can you take information embedded in text and use it to answer questions to solve a problem. Numeracy, same thing. Not can you add three numbers together. Can you solve an equation with one unknown? But rather, can you take numerical information and apply it to the solution of a problem or to a question someone might ask you? We put out, um, it's nature of the way we work, Oh, by the way, why the PIAC test? Again, slight editorial, cynical excursion about Canada and Canadian entrepreneurship. The PIAC test originated in the OECD. Canada, when it first came out, loved the PIAC test. And the Canadian federal government spent gazillions of dollars validating the PIAC test in Canada, in both English and French oversampled by a huge amount, rural areas, areas, uh, indigenous students, etc., to validate the PIAC test. So we spend, the Fed spent a huge amount of money, we helped develop the PIAC, it's an online version. We take that intellectual property and we send it to the OECD, we give it to them. The OECD, licenses the intellectual property to Educational Testing Service, a huge group in Princeton, New Jersey. It's in the Educational Testing Service. And so when I say we use the online PIAC, we had to buy the online PIAC 
in American dollars from an American institution that paid licensing fees to the OECD, and we put the money to do the psychometric validation of it. I suppose that's Canadian entrepreneurship, but editorial aside. We put out an RFP. We say to colleges and universities, look, this is what we want to do. We want to use this test. This is what it measures. We want to measure not the absolute levels, but the change in these things from your entering class to your finishing class. We have 14 colleges, six universities that participated in this test. So it was a two-year trial. We're now at the end of it. Um, I can't tell you exactly what the results are. We're still in the process of analyzing it. But this is a direct measurement of the capacities and skills and the, de and the development of these skills in college and university students in Canada. We have worked this out to a science so that all of the privacy, the legal issues, this is scalable to the provincial and national level. Now, you might say, why are universities in the business of measuring literacy and numeracy? I understand that argument. But if you think those are skills students should have, we have the capacity to answer how good our students are in the distribution of scores. Equally, we have psychometrically valid tests of critical thinking. There are certain attributes that we want skills to have that we don't have psychometrically valid instruments yet. But if we think those skills and attributes are important, we should measure them. We should develop the tests and measure them. So do we have the capacity to actually go and measure some of these skills and attributes? It's as easy as giving students a final exam. Now, there are some people who will also say, look, what you're asking us to do is, more, is different from what we're doing now. The answer, yes. It's more than we're doing now. You know what governments are like. They squeeze us. We don't have the resources to do this. And so I want to remind you of one other conclusion that one can draw from Canadian data in higher education. And that is, rarely are outcomes about the money. We conducted a large assessment of 34 outcome variables in the 10 provinces of Canada. And we asked the simple, and we rated the performance for the best we could on the best we could on those 34 attributes of the system, not of individual institutions. And we know that what governments are told all the time is, if you want us to perform better, you got to give us more money. So here's what the data actually look like. There's zero correlation between the performance of provincial systems and their outcomes. There are provinces that are performing relatively well. That's on the y-axis, total performance score, massaged in particular ways. Total performance score, the higher you are, the higher you're performing. The lower you are, the worse you're performing. And this is revenue per student. And this is how, it's, so within the range of funding that we see in Canada, it's not about the money. It's about how money is spent and the outcomes that you will insist upon if you get there. By the way, we know there are people that don't like all 34 of our outcomes. We know there are people who don't like this conclusion. So one of the things we did, we had a, a terrific employee at HECO, civil engineer, in fact, an aeronautics engineer. Curious story why she was working with us, but she did. So she did a bunch of simulations. And she asked the question of when does this relationship break down? If you were not to like all 34 outcomes, but only like 30 of them, would you see the same thing? And she developed a tool that's available on our website that allows any individual, government, jurisdiction to customize which outcomes they want and put it in and see what it is. The reason we're confident in this conclusion is because unless you so degrade the analysis to the point where you have one or two and no more outcomes, this is what you get. Oh, you get a little bit of jiggle. But the fundamental relationship 
of money not predicting performance holds up. I could tell you more about trials we're doing working with institutions to measure critical thinking to credential, but I'll simply leave you with this. The game now is the teaching, the assessment, and the credentialing of skills. Again, it's no one will relieve you of the need or your obligation to teach content and knowledge and information. You got, it's not going away. But the game changer here is the focus, the emphasis on the teaching, the acquisition, the measurement, and the assessment of skills. And if we find when we go through this process, and there's, a lot, and there's some research to support this now, that our students are not acquiring some of the skills we asserted they would, then we're left with, in my opinion, is a fascinatingly interesting and exciting problem in higher education, which is how do we do a better job of teaching skills? We don't necessarily know the answer to that. Simple assertions that if everyone's in a co-op program or an experiential basis, experientially based course, they will magically acquire these skills? I don't know. That may be true, may not be true. But a lot of people I know are from Missouri and won't believe any of it until you actually conduct an assessment and show them the numbers. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a fundamental rethinking about the way we organize our courses, the way we think about how we write course outlines, think about assessment of not just knowledge and content, but skills. And we think about how to credential these things, because st everyone still wants you to validate the credential. And we work with a series of terrific investigators, academics, who are working on exactly those problems in their domains, be it social sciences, engineering, or physical sciences. But it does require us to think about our curriculum and our programs, how they're structured, how they're delivered, how they're assessed. And whenever you talk like that, I'm reminded of Woodrow Wilson. Before Woodrow Wilson became the president of the United States, he had a far more difficult job, which is being the president of Princeton University. And when he was the president of Princeton, his, this was about the turn of the century, 1900s. He thought, geez, we should do a better job on our undergraduate curriculum. So for three years, he engaged the Princeton faculty in a serious, comprehensive discussion about what the Princeton undergraduate curriculum should be like. What should be taught? What should they learn? How do we know this, et cetera? And after three years of this conversation, he gave up. And he said the following. Changing a college curriculum is like moving a graveyard. You never know how many friends the dead have until you try to move them. It's time to move the dead. And when we try to remove the dead, we have to remember, I'm not an economist. I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm not an economist, but most good economists are psychologists. And in his introduction to the general theory of employment, interest, and money, John Maynard Keynes wrote the following. The difficulties lie not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones which ramify into every corner of our minds. We have some very exciting new ideas about what higher education is about and how we could improve it. And it's time to forget some of the things we know that, are not, that don't work particularly well, that are not supported by the data, and move onto them. Now, final comment. What if we don't do this? Will the world come to an end? No. But this is what I do know. People are not happy. Remember the days when people loved universities? They used to love even university presidents. 
I used to love university professors. We, you, I try to still include myself, we were the good guys. We're not the good guys anymore. Governments really don't like us. They regard us as self-absorbed, entitled people who don't work very hard and don't make the contribution they want from us. Employers don't like us because we're not doing the job they think we need to do. Students don't like us. They'll do anything to get, they came here for a credential and they'll do anything you ask them to do, jump through any hoop to get that credential. But if you look at student surveys of their, 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 their sense of their undergraduate education, I hope my kids think more kindly of me as a parent than they do of me, than my students did of me as a professor. And this is what's happening around the world. We call them shots across the bow. This sense of frustration, this sense that we need something out of our universities, we're not getting it, is driving governments to do things that I don't think they would have contemplated five, 10 years ago. So, Japan, social sciences and humanities faculties to close in Japan after ministerial intervention. He says, we don't need them anymore. I don't know why people were surprised by this. The UK came to that decision about five years before. They don't put money anymore into social sciences and humanities programs. If the student chooses to go there, that's their issue. You get their tuition money. There's no grant money going into anything but STEM in the UK. Oh yeah, I love this one. Government to, apply, to allow better universities to raise fees. One of the biggest experiments going on in higher education is happening in the United Kingdom and England, United Kingdom. They have an office of students. Eternal issue, how much should an institution be allowed to raise their fees and tuition? The view in England is that they will do assessment of student satisfaction and if students are satisfied with you, you can raise fees. And if they are not satisfied with you, you can't. Student satisfaction scores, driving decisions about this revenue source, which by the way now is the dominant revenue source for higher education institutions. University of North Carolina, his kid comes home first semester, Thanksgiving. And the parent, who's a state legislator, says to the kid, hey, tell me about your courses in North Carolina, in the University of North Carolina. The kid starts telling, he says, tell me about your professors. And the politician finds out that all the courses are being taught by graduate students and sessionals. This person has no full-time professor teaching them. He goes into the state legislator and says, this is outrageous. And brings in a, a, a bill in the legislature mandating an eight course undergraduate teaching load at the University of North Carolina system. Inhuman, ridiculous, right? Okay, it didn't go through, but it's only because he's just gonna decrease the number and go to some other number. It's not going away. Oh yeah, Nova Scotia, they're on a roll. They pass a law, mandatory financial reporting to the government when the government thinks you're in financial trouble, they abrogate your, they put your collective agreement into suspension, and there's a variety of things that happen there. Tennessee with performance-based funding, and this is the daddy of them all, uh, killing tenure. Two states in the United States, including the University of Wisconsin system. My God, the University of Wisconsin public higher education system was a jewel in the United States. There's no more tenure there for new people being hired. I once had someone describe to me what it's like sitting around the government treasury board table when budget time comes up. Let me go around. Uh, K to 12, well we can't touch K to 12, it's all about schools and stuff like that. Good. Uh, infrastructure, well you know in Alberta infrastructure is a religion. You build buildings. Roads, oh, there's no way we're not paving those roads out there. Right? More prevalent in Alberta. You know, Alberta has more paved roads, kilometers of paved roads per person than any province in Canada. A slight aside for you. Um, 
And then the guy describes, we go around, we go around, and then the guy says, uh, you, post-secondary. And before the guy opens his mouth, everyone says, post-secondary. That's where we're going to get our money. And that's what's going on across Canada. It's not unique. And there's a variety of ways that governments are intervening. And my simple message is, it's not going away. They will continue to do that. And the only way to get them off it is to start taking control of the agenda. But the agenda is not to browbeat them over revenue. The agenda is not to browbeat them over things we normally talk to them about. 20 years of advocacy hasn't proved to be very effective. The only thing we should talk to them about is about what everyone really cares about and what we care about, which is graduating the most highly educated students with the right knowledge and skill set. And we just got to get on to that. Um, I'm going to leave it with that, with w one other thing about who we are. Bob Ray was asked by the Premier of the province in 2025, in, in that, sorry, was asked by the Premier of the province in 2005 to do an analysis of post-secondary education in Alberta. Bob notes that the decisions being made to allocate billions of dollars are being made on the basis of gut feel, stories, anecdotes, things the chauffeur told you on the way in, and no one evaluates whether the money's being well spent. And he says it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a group of people who would study the Ontario system, evidence-based, and provide advice to the government. And that's what we do. So do I have opinions about higher education? You better have tons of them. But our job and what we do is analyze the international best practice, look at evidence, data, and let that inform the advice we give to government. And that's what I hope I did today. And if any of you, we publish reports up the yin gang. And if any of you ever want to know about what we do, if you give me your business card, I will put you on our mailing list. I promise I won't send you, we won't send you more than one email a week. And we have a little contest going on in the shop. And if you give me your business card, I can catapult myself into second place. So I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Dr. Weingarten. So I think we have about 20 minutes for quite, we already have a hand up. Oh my goodness. Um, we have two roving mics. So I'm gonna hand one to Suzanne, if that's okay. And I one of the nice things about working in my shop is uh, we're 28 people. About 13 of them are about 25 to 35 years old. To me, that's young. Advanced degrees, variety of things, some just with a bachelor's degree. And uh, we see the world quite differently. So one of the things I'm very mindful of, I love to torment them because I'm the boss. And I make reference to old TV shows which they then go back to their office and go to Google and say, what is this guy talking about? So this is like the Phil Donahue show. Sorry for those who, yes. Hi, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking talk. I was interested in the performance versus revenue slide, uh, as doubtless many were also in the room. And I wonder if I could query on, A, how total performance was measured, Yes. and B, what the sample sizes were per province and what the confidence limits were on the data. You can do that. I will answer it in brief here. But if you go to the website and look at Performance 2015, you can see the whole thing in all of its glory. But the answer um, to your question is 34 outcome measures, some that had to do with access, some that were things about value to students, did they enjoy, uh, and some value to society. So we ask questions like, did students enjoy their experience? Did they get a job afterwards? How much in debt were they? Value to society. Did it serve as a magnet to bring people to the jurisdiction? Uh, startups, stuff like, stuff like, so a variety of things. Each one could be criticized. And because we were doing a cross Canada comparison, we could only work on measures where there were reasonable comparative data in all 10 provinces. So we were limited to that. I normally have a slide, but if you go there, there's one page that shows you all of the measures. And, and again, most of these are reports. There's a fuzziness to all of these data. 
By the way, I would suggest to you the healthcare system. If I was to put up a graph here of healthcare in Canada, you'd see exactly the same thing. Some confidence limits on the data? You have to go to the data. They're, they're, where they're available, they're reported there. But most of these are survey data. And so sure. there's hmm? survey data taken by the jurisdictions themselves and then reported in a variety of ways. Mm. So I have seen similar data on health measures, for example, yeah. and those are limited by sample size. Could be. So I would simply say this. I am open to any charge that the data we have now are inadequate. I accept that. We spend a lot of time trying to get better data. One of the great frustrations of my life is that there's better data than we have sitting in the bowels of government and sitting in the institutional analysis group in this university. And guess who refuses to divulge most of these data? So let's get the data, let's put it into the public domain, let's have an intelligent discussion of them. Yeah. Um, Neil Hovey from Augustana, um, down in Camrose. Um, really interesting talk, really enjoyed it. It, it. it seems to me that, there, that there's a convergence going on around some of the stuff that you're talking about in terms of quality assurance of education, um, evidence-based teaching practices, how we do our student evaluations of teaching, um, and then also um, this question of content versus squill, skills. I, I characterize that as um, how we teach is as important as what we teach. Just wanted to know any comments from you about that. I'm going to be true to the line and say the following. I don't care how you teach, as long as you produce the outcomes you're looking for. But tell us what those outcomes are and measure whether they were achieved. And I know folks, I was telling Sarah there, there's a fellow who teaches um, taught Calculus One at McMaster. Is there a more despised course among in undergraduates in Calculus One? This guy every year would win teaching awards. I don't know how, the guy, I, mean, was, I used to go, I sat in on his class. There was nothing special about what this fellow did. He just seemed to get results, right? So I'm, I'm going to be really, I, 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 I'm going to be uh, dog, doctrinaire here. You should be held accountable for outcomes. How you produce those outcomes is an exercise you will go through and you will figure out. If you establish a set of outcomes that you're looking for, you want students to develop these skills and knowledge, and you find out that you're not doing as good a job as you would like, I have no doubt that you will seek guidance from other people, you will change the what you're doing, because you want to get those, you want to optimize your outcomes. I don't want to tell you how to do that. But I do know that governments have a legitimate role in thinking about how the outcomes being produced by public funds. So they're going to ask questions. I do know that administrators have a legitimate role in asking questions about how money is spent and whether it's being spent effectively. We all have the shared goal of trying to use whatever money we have in the most effective way with the best outcomes. But uh, it's important for us that governments stay at the level of outcomes. I don't think you want government coming in and intervening in how you do your work and process. What they should insist on is that the institution is rigorous and disciplined about measuring those things. And I would argue further that these things are publicly disclosed. Um, so I guess just to follow up on that, um, there is a lot of emphasis right now to, or seems to be some pressure in, in making classrooms more activity-based learning as opposed to direct content. Um, and so do you find that, and again, I guess depending on the learning outcome that you may uh, direct what type of approach you take, um, I find that students are often coming in 
and if they come in to say a first year class where if it were so heavy on activity based learning that students are shocked by that, that they have an expectation to sit and be taught and told what you know they should be learning and what have you. I guess I would ask you what would your advice be say for an intro type of class, say psychology for example, um, when it comes to beginning to maybe change towards some of these types of learning outcomes and more critical thinking of sort of a balance between content teaching and activity based type of learning? Uh, very good, good question. Look, content is the mechanism by which we help students develop skills. You can't get away from that. So you can't, you know, um, these courses that are all, you'll excuse my language, they're all about yakking and skills with zero content. I don't get them, right? And I think it would be helpful if actually someone did an analysis of whether all of that talking actually leads to skills development. Equally, if you have to teach the three principles of thermodynamics, three laws of thermodynamics, maybe I'm a troglodyte, but I don't think it's so terrible to have a class of 300 and someone's lecturing to them about fundamental pieces of information they need. That said, there are some people, and I would direct you, and if you want, we can take this offline. There's a fellow we work with, Steve Jordans, in the psych department at the University of Toronto huge class, where he engages in things where he puts students, all done online, it's, it's interesting, online peer evaluation of critical appraisal of information, graded by students, and um, we fund a big trial that he's doing. And so there are people who are trying that. The other thing that I would say, if you look at the people who do um, the National Survey of Student Engagement. Right? I'm not a big fan of student satisfaction scores. Your students can love you and you can teach them nothing. And your students can hate you and taught them a lot. But one of the things they do, and it's impressive to me, is they're working on what are the kind of processes to use in a classroom that the evidence shows lead to better learning. And there are things. So paying attention, if we can't measure some of the outcomes, skills directly, measuring whether people are engaging in those processes that actually we know from good experiments lead to better learning, that's a pretty good proxy, better than student satisfaction. We're putting out a, we had a conference and workshop in May, we brought 12 people from around the world on this problem of measuring academic quality. Because one of the things, one of our jobs is to create a, dash, a performance dashboard for the Ontario system. In our view, most of what Ontario measures is silly, right? What we should measure, and what you almost never find in a dashboard, is some measurement of whether students have learned anything. So we bring these, we don't know how to do this, we bring these people together. It was a very illuminating 10 days. It was, um, um, everyone writes a chapter, we, have, you know, we do what people do, we have a book. But the chapter by the people, the, the Kinsey and McCormick, who are, the, who are the Nessie people, is very informative with respect to what kind of processes and indicators do we have evidence for that leads to better learning. And, and, and afterwards, tell me how to get in touch with you, I'll send you those two papers. There's two papers, yeah. But even in big classes, look, you're not going to get rid of them, right? They're going to be big classes. And I'm not sure they're bad. But what we do in those classes can make a difference, I think. Again, enjoyed the discussion and the easy um, scale or the project that you're doing. Uh, interesting that you had six universities and 14 colleges. Um, I would have maybe guessed that that would have been an exploding number, far surpassing um, what what you have in your 
dashboard or your willingness to participate. So curious, like were people, what was the engagement like to get involved with that? And was there sort of sufficient marketing, if that's the thing, or is there an actual reluctance to, to do that? Because to me, that's a very compelling uh, type of project. And I noticed our university was not on the list. So um, how, do we, how do we engage at that level if these are important measures? So when the call went out, we had a betting line in the shop. We expected a couple of colleges, one or two universities. We were shocked by this. By the way, there's some that we had a bigger response rate, some we couldn't work out the deal with, and I'll tell you what the deal was. So we were shocked by this. We go back to the government and say, look, we didn't expect this response, but we don't want to say no to these people. But for us to scale up to this level, we're going to need some extra money. And the government said, we can't say no to this, right? Oh, so that was a large response. You expected less than that. Oh, a lot less than that. No. Oh, God, no. Um, no, this was... Now, why did they do it? There were several motivations. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we expected more colleges. They've been on the learning outcomes kick in Ontario much longer than the universities have. And they take it much more seriously than the universities do. So we expected more from them. Um, there is genuine interest in knowing what their students are learning. <laughs> I mean, I think to be fair, the motivation of most of these people, of the places that participated, was that, oh, this is an important question. Let's see if we can contribute. We cut a deal with every, every institution had to do their own ethics approval. We customized the trial within each, within each institution to take into account what the institution wanted to know. So for example, McMaster University has a traditional science program and has an interdisciplinary science program. The people in the interdisciplinary science program are of the view that they do a better job teaching people how to be scientists. And they're better scientists because they've gone through an interdisciplinary problem-based program. They were prepared to put it to the test. You know, comparing those two. So everyone tailored to what they want. Ultimately, they will have to, and, and that was important to us. Look, we, we rely on partnerships, not, right? So if an institution didn't see value in participating, they would have just bowed out. There's a lot of work for them. We helped them a lot. We had a lot of the administration, a lot of the methodology work, and buying the kits and all this kind of stuff. But no, we, regard, we were surprised by the response. Um, but encouraged by it. And when will the results be out? Probably uh, March, April of next year. And again, it's very much a we call, it's very much a trial. One of the things we learned is that if you want the right sample size, if you want to do this well, and you have to do it in a more formal, scaled-up way than we did it. What we figured out is a it can be done, and it tells you something interesting. But it can be done. That was a major part of the trial. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, it's Debbie. And I just wanted to follow up on that to understand what the range of what could be tested in terms of um, degree. So was that strictly undergraduate focused, or have you ventured in, did it venture into master's and PhD? Strictly undergraduate. So we looked at students in the first year of their program, and we got a co. We did a cross-sectional students in the final year of their program. If you were really going to do this well, you'd follow students longitudinally. We didn't go into graduate. Um, it's different. It's different. The dynamics are different. The engagement is different. It's interesting to us that there are now, though, places uh, that are speaking to the issue of skills they expect in graduate students. Yeah. Okay. Right? Thank you very much, Harvey. You're welcome.